Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Mail Lab Podcast Season 2. And we are kicking off this season. This is our very first episode, full-length episode of Season 2. And we are joined with Cal and Caroline Mayo. And I am just so thrilled beyond words to have you guys in the studio with us. And I know Megan feels the same way. Um, And for our listeners who have no idea who this is, well, the Mayo Lab, you are going to find out uh, very soon. And so, Cal and Caroline, thank you for joining us and welcome to the Mayo Lab podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So just to start us off, kind of how did we get here? Kind of the Mayo Lab and how, you know, this story, if you guys would share kind of the story for those as long as much as you would like just for our listeners to kind of get a little insight. Sure. I'll I'll try to give you the, uh, the shorter version instead of taking up all the time we have this afternoon. So... Uh, Caroline and I have been here in Oxford, I guess, since the mid nineties and we moved here with three children and had our fourth child here in Oxford, um, in the early two thousands. Uh, he was our son, Thomas. He was eight years younger than our oldest, oldest child and six years younger than our twins. Uh, in some ways an, an only child and in some ways, um, yeah, just the, the, the youngest of the bunch, but uh, Thomas graduated from high school here in Oxford, had a, a very, uh, you know, I'd say fairly typical high school experience. He was a good student. He was a, he played sports and uh, enrolled here at the University of Mississippi as his three older siblings had. Uh, the difference for Thomas uh, probably was some of who Thomas was, and, and we can talk about some of that later, but he also came along uh, his freshman year was when COVID hit and so he was halfway through his uh, first year I guess into the spring of his second semester when he had to move home and live with his parents which was uh, certainly not something his parents wanted to have happen and uh, I can assure you Thomas wanted it much less than his parents did but he he, um, went back his sophomore year uh, things were not going as they should have and ultimately uh, he got a DUI and came to us and told us he had a Xanax problem. So uh, Thomas, this was in late April of 21. 21. Thomas went off uh, and after several conversations with David McGee and with David's good direction and, and assistance, uh, Thomas went off for a 30-day program. He came back and for at least as much as we know, the Xanax problem was problem was gone. Um hindsight being remarkably clear, there's probably a number of things we should have done differently at that point, but we let Thomas come back. Uh, He went back into school. He moved in with some friends who were good, supportive friends uh, of Thomas's, but he was back in the same environment he had been in before. Uh, We tried as best we could to keep a handle on what was going on. Um, we We did not think he was back in recreational drug use, and most of his friends the ones we spoke with, all of his friends, reinforced that. But uh, Thomas was back into recreational drug use, we ultimately found out. But that didn't come to light until, unfortunately, too late. Um, so in the spring, uh, April of 2022, um, after we had been at a lovely family wedding in Florida with our son and new daughter-in-law, and shortly after the birth of our grandson, <clears throat> um, Thomas went out with some fraternity, two fraternity brothers, and they bought what they thought were Percocet. They uh, ingested them. They went to a fraternity party. They bought some more. They ingested those, and Thomas went back to his off-campus residence. He uh, stayed up with friends, partying for a while. He went to sleep, and then he never woke up. Uh, That was the morning of the 14th of April. Um, So... How we got from there to where we are now is that uh, among the the memorials we listed in <clears throat> Thomas's obituary was the McGee Center, and uh, we were just we were overwhelmed, overwhelmed. by the yeah. amount of contributions that came in, and humbled, overwhelmed, and the McGee Center and David McGee and the foundation guided us to set up the Thomas Hayes Mayo Lab. And thanks to the two of y'all as well for your great involvement in that. But that that is how we got to the lab. Um, it was a way to use the, the funds that came in um, in Thomas's memory into the foundation in the Thomas Mayo Fund uh, that was eventually used to fund the lab. So 
we are yeah. thrilled uh, that something good can be done in, in his memory. Um, there's still good days and bad days that, that we go through, but uh, it's a, a wonderful um, wonderful way to keep alive his memory. Yeah, yeah. And I think what we love about the Mayo Lab podcast specifically is like we get to share stories like this and let people know, A, you're not alone. Um, so many people listening I know will have a, someone in their life or family member that will have gone through this or will, you know, hopefully, you know, we never wish that upon people, but to equip them in ways that is just so powerful that you can't do, you know, through a school you know school books and while that's great but having personal stories and so if you don't mind i'm going to circle back real quick of when thomas came to y'all what was that like for each of you and then you guys together as parents kind of the conversations had and if you would mind sharing like with other like with listeners of if you would have done things differently or what are you proud of in that moment kind of recapping that sure go ahead. yeah i don't think we were surprised when thomas came to us and said he had a problem i think parents have gut instincts when something is not right and I felt that I know Cal felt that so when he came to us we were just proud that he shared opened up admitted to what was going on with the Xanax problem and asked to go to treatment so I mean we hopped on it Um, we picked Cumberland Heights and um, went for 30 days and um, we felt like it helped at the time Um, we also we didn't keep this a secret even though this was thomas's story to share we were open with our friends and family members about treatment um yeah and and that's we didn't want thomas to think that it was embarrassing to us we didn't want to put it on the billboard that he was at treatment but we tried to find a place in between that that was thomas made the right choice he came forward he was strong enough to have this discussion with us and if he was willing to do it, then we were hoping that he could be a guide for others because we knew he was not alone. We knew there were others that were doing the same thing. So, and Thomas was comfortable with that. I think he 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 was not embarrassed about going to treatment, other than he felt like, um, and this was another just part of Thomas's psyche. Uh, as the fourth child, he always felt like he was, didn't live up to the standard of his siblings, and that's you know, m- more of the mental health side of things than his uh, substance abuse, uh, m- specific substance abuse problems. But he, um, you know, we, we, we were proud he had come forward and we praised him for that. And I think when he came out of treatment, it was probably the healthiest he had been in uh, several years since his senior year of high school. Uh, he, he appeared to be in a really good place then. So, and we were, we were extremely hopeful. Yes, At that I, point. I do think if we had to do it all over again, one of the things we would have done differently is maybe encouraged him not to go back into the college environment. Um, of course, he wanted to, um, and there's when the stigma comes in. We wanted him to have the normal, normal college experience, a well-rounded experience like our older three children um, had. So we didn't or we let him talk us into going back into that environment. Um, if, if if I could do it over again, I think I would do something different. Take a break. Go we, out west. Go be in nature. <laughs> we we used it the, as the excuse that COVID was still going on in the summer of 21, and there were limited options available to him. But that was really more of an excuse than a reason to not dig deeper and insist that he go away. But we didn't. And that was the decision we made. You know, we could have at least insisted he lived home with us. We didn't do that. Um, you know, all those things we look back at now and, and should have, would have, could have. But um, that we are where we are. And, you know, <laughs> we've learned a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, you know, incredibly thankful and grateful that you've allowed us to use Thomas's name in the founding of the Thomas Hayes Mayo Lab and the Mayo Lab podcast. Um, it's uh, through the conversations that we have had and, and getting to know both of you. It's just a tremendous privilege to be in this space and be sharing these conversations with you. Um, and and I'd like to just transition us a little bit and, and thinking more forward. I know both of you have been involved in lots of different efforts around the state and have, have continued these conversations and continued sharing your own story and Thomas's story. And so I'd like to dive into that a little bit more, if you all would be willing. Um, what what have you been up to, uh, you know, besides founding this amazing lab and the podcast and all of those kind of things? What else have you been doing in 
in this space. So I'll let Caroline talk a little bit about our um, our kind of vision for the lab and, and our excitement and the, the wonderful work y'all have done, by the way. Thank you. We should have opened with that. No, yes. For y'all, you y'all have done no thank yous. We, a, you thank a fantastic yous. job. And we're, <laughs> we're excited about the second season of the uh, of the podcast. The first season was so well done. And we have enjoyed listening to all the episodes. In my journey in, in kind of what I've done in, in, in this space, I guess, to use the, the vernacular, started the day of Thomas's funeral service when <clears throat> I expected to go to his fraternity house and speak to a small group of his friends and ended up there in front of the whole fraternity and parents and girlfriends and, and a, a, a big crowd. And it kind <clears> of <throat> immediately forced me into talking about him. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, once I did it, I, I realized a couple of things. Number one, everybody listened. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was a, a very important topic for them. So I knew there were people that wanted information mm-hmm. about what had happened to Thomas and, and how can I make that do- make sure that doesn't happen mm-hmm. to me. Uh, I knew I'd, I needed a lot more information myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of weaned through uh, a little bit of information I had at that point. Mm-hmm. I'm a lot better educated now. But so I, I have gone um, on a number of occasions and talked to fraternity groups and other groups of people, mostly young people, um, about the dangers of fentanyl, what's going on on college campuses today, that it, fentanyl really is a game changer. It's different than anything. Mm-hmm. Other, our older children did not have to deal with this. Right. That's six years between yeah. them graduating in 2000, uh, I guess, 13 from high school and Thomas finished in 19 his next older siblings that that span of time just changed recreational drug use mm-hmm. on college campuses I mean it weeds more potent than it was y'all, y'all mm-hmm. talked about that but mm-hmm. fentanyl is that hidden danger that it can be in any pill any substance it can be anywhere uh, and that that is information a lot of people are not completely aware of if they think they know about it they really don't if they think they appreciate how uh, powerful and how um, deadly fentanyl can be, and how little fentanyl it takes. Mm-hmm. You know, and I use Thomas's story because he was with two other young men, and thank goodness they lived. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas didn't. He got the. You know, he played the game of Russian roulette and he lost. Mm-hmm. The other two survived, and that's how mm-hmm. random it can be. Right. Um, so, I, I have spent a lot of time talking with groups, trying to educate them, and also thanks again to information that I've uh, gleaned from y'all. Uh, <laughs> I've expanded it to talking also just about mental health generally mm-hmm. and weave in mm-hmm. that topic because, as y'all know, it's all interrelated. It's it's not two separate topics. Okay. It's all the same discussion, and it's one we didn't fully realize with Thomas until mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And and we do realize that he there were mental health problems that he had and issues he was dealing with, whether he was – he had addiction tendencies or whether he just was an abuser or what, where he fell on the, the spectrum of drug use, there was something driving him to do that. And we, we never tapped into it like I wish we had. Mm-hmm. So that is part of the topic that I, that I cover when I talk. And I've written a, a couple of articles um, as well that have been published or one has been published, one will be published on the same topic. So it really mine is just trying to push information out mm-hmm. and let as many parents and, and young people know about what happened to us. And right. again, it's through the storytelling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I lead the public speaking up to Cal. So I'm, <laughs> I'm more in the background, but just sharing Tom's story mm-hmm. with friends, mm-hmm. um, uh, parents of his friends. Um, I was involved in the Thomas H. Mayo 5K this mm-hmm. past spring that his fraternity um, put on uh, and it was a wild success. It was yeah, a great, it was so success. much fun. Over eight hundred people participated. I think sixty-seven thousand mm-hmm. dollars were raised. Mm-hmm. Um, one of his mom's best friends in the fraternity came to me with this idea, and she assembled a dream team and they ran with it. and It was an amazing event, and we hope that can happen every year as their mm-hmm. annual charity. Um, but mainly just being open and honest when people ask me about Thomas um, and sharing, you know, that it can happen to anybody. Um, mm-hmm. Thomas wasn't some bum on the street, you know. He was just your typical college kid. That yeah, yeah. And I think we've, we we're we're making progress of the 
when we have stigma, it's it used to be them and they over there. And it's not necessarily become the we, but it has become like people they know and they're understanding it's maybe a little closer to home. And so, and people like you guys are just doing a great job of breaking down that barrier of like, it's, it happens to everyone and it it is sad and, you know, we're going to use it for the best power we can for good. And it's just been so inspiring to be a part of that and just continue to have the we mindset of this is all of us. Um, And so since you guys have established this lab, kind of what are your goal or what did you establish this lab with the goal of doing? And then now that it's kind of, we're in a year almost plus of it, what are you hopeful for the future for it to come? Well, obviously to educate parents and students, and y'all are doing an amazing job with that. Um, And we hope to get some kind of curriculum in Mm -hmm. schools, starting in middle school, the earlier we can talk to our children about the dangers and any kind of mental health issue, the better. Um, But... Yeah, I, I, I think that the there's so many things that can be done uh, through the lab, but our our view has been, as Caroline was saying, that, and, and this is consistent, we were talking before we went on, on our podcast about John Broderick and what he's doing. You know, the, he started at the high schools and he's gone down, mm-hmm. and, and as you read in his book, and he's talked to middle schools and he gets the same reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, children of all ages and probably more so than parents right now are hungry for attention dealing with mental health issues drug abuse issues Mm -hmm. um you know eating disorders all all of that rolls into the same big pot of Mm -hmm. of messiness and Mm -hmm. we we want to tap into that we we, and, and we don't know how to do it we we can give a we can set up a vehicle we can help raise the money but we need experts like y'all to work with others to help make that a reality but that would be our our dream is that there is some program that is rolled out um into high schools and all the way down as low as it's acceptable from mm-hmm. educational standpoint to talk about things that mm-hmm. we for too long have been afraid to talk about and we think that it's a sign of weakness or something, and it's really not. It's right. just a, a sign of a health problem like any other health problem. Right, right. Well, and I think that one of the things that that, that makes me think about, right, is, and I've seen quotations to this effect around more recently, is like, our young, our kids, our children are capable and able to deal with a lot more than we often give them credit for, right, in terms of these kinds of conversations. We often think, oh, they're too young to think about drugs and alcohol and, you know, complicated relationships with friends. But my most complicated relationships came in middle school, right, of all places. And we don't really have those conversations. And I think that we we want as parents, I think we want to keep our kids safe, right, and prevent those things from happening. Um, But one of the things I want to applaud both of you for in this space is that you have been so incredibly brave and and honest in your experience and in sharing that with other people, because I think that's where other parents struggle. They never want to have to do this, um, but they also don't know where to start. And you guys have been incredible examples of just doing the hard thing and I want to applaud both of you for that because that is not something that a lot of people have have been able to do and I think that's you're part of this educational mission you may not have the fancy letters after your name but you're absolutely part of this and and I want to thank you both for for that because this is an amazing first step in that direction to help us get get this whole mission flowing and going it's not just for the kids it's for all of us how do we level all of us up so that we do better next time yeah, I don't. It was never a question whether to be honest about Thomas's story. I mean, I think from the day he died, we looked at each other and we're like, we're we're not going to hide anything. Yeah. If, we, if we can save one life, or if one life can be saved mm-hmm. from Thomas's tragedy, then it's worth it to be honest. And I thought a lot before coming into this podcast today. If I was listening as a parent, what would I want to hear? You know, mm-hmm. what what would I have done? We I have done differently. And I think about this a lot, um, and this is very hard to get an 18, 19, 20, particularly a male, to open up, but I would have been more persistent in getting Thomas to, to share his feelings. You know what? Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we, we had those talks. You know, tell us what's going on. How are you feeling? Fine, Mom. I'm fine, Dad. But I, I would have kept on it more. Mm-hmm. And I think I tried to um, pump self-confidence into Thomas instead of getting him to talk and just be there to listen. Um, You know, I'd say things like, Thomas, you're so smart. You're so handsome. You're so funny. You're so kind. Everybody loves you. You know, why why don't you have self-confidence, you know? 
instead of really trying to get him to open up to share those things that were bothering yeah. him. Yeah. And that's hard to do. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and to be very clear, <laughs> one thing I tell people every time I talk, and I should say it here, you know, Caroline and I don't have all the answers. Uh, we're just trying to make everyone else understand the questions need to be asked. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that's how we get to the answers is mm-hmm. we have to ask the questions. And we a lot of it's probably trial and error. And, you know, as parents, we do things wrong sometimes. Um, but the effort at communicating with our children and, and understanding what's going on as best we can with them and letting them you know, being able to listen. Yeah, all. not judge, not mm-hmm. not give them the solutions, but truly just to listen. Just listen and let them talk. Uh, and, and it is hard. I mean, I, I tell people that, you know, I, our two daughters, they went away when they were about 11 or 12 and came back when they're about 18 or 19. <laughs> and my boys went away when they're about 15 or 16. And William came back when he was about 22 or 23. Yeah. Yeah. And and we were just seeing a little bit of that with Thomas. you know. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. But there's a, there's a part, they have to go away. And I think that's part of maturing. And as a parent, you have to keep your tentacles out there as best you can mm-hmm. keep the antenna up to see things and hear things but um getting the information being willing to make mistakes with your children but don't give up mm-hmm. um, and 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 don't feel like you have to have all the answers as parents because we don't right and we have no clue you know that and you, a whole episode on social media and I didn't have to deal with that. Right. Um, you know, that's all after our time. And there is a lot of pressure that comes from social media, the expectations mm-hmm. of perfection and yep. that everybody else's world is a perfect world. And if you have any anxieties about what's going on in your life, it's just multiplied by seeing perfection in everybody else. That's, that's a reality that young people have to deal with. And yeah. So a lot of it I don't understand, but... Uh, you can't find out the answers if you don't ask the questions. And that's really kind of what we see the Mayo Lab doing is mm-hmm. gathering the information, trying to improve the situation for our young people. When things don't work, try something else. Right, right. And I think that um, I, I, I love that perspective and that, that approach to this kind of work because this is a sticky, complicated, messy, wicked problem that's been around for a long time. And until, like you say, we start asking those questions with an open heart and an open mind, figuring out those solutions and being brave enough to try and fail and try again, we're not going to get any closer to those to those solutions and that ultimate objective of, of you know, saving just one life, like you said, Caroline. Like that, that to me is so exactly what we do here at the Mayo Lab and and with this podcast repackaging that information and getting it out to a huge audience hopefully in a way that everybody understands and will deconstruct some of that scientific garbly goop in the meantime so everybody gets it right um so I just think that that's just that you summarized it just so beautifully so thank you yes Um, dive in a little bit into the stigma topic that this season's going to be on. We know stigma is just huge. We've all faced it. We've all felt it, I think, at this table. But I want to dive into a little bit specifically stigma for you guys and just ask you what stigma looked like or was to you guys before Thomas's passing and what it is now to you around this idea of substance use. And if your family's faced it, kind of how you've walked through that with your family and your other three kids and just stigma as it lives currently for you guys? Sure. So um, I, I think any discussion about stigma has to start with a look in the mirror, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and being honest with ourselves um, about our own lives. And uh, I, I've told this to groups I talk to, the, none of us are wired perfectly. Uh, we all have our um uh, anxieties, depressions, emotional distress moments that will come up in our lives. And it is hard for us to admit that um, because we want people to think that we are not necessarily are perfect, but that we don't have problems and we, and we do. Um, 
just as a brief aside, I thought maybe we should set aside a certain amount of money that everybody gets in a, a bank account that we can use for counseling throughout our lives. It's just, <laughs> yes. a, it's just a, 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 we can draw down on it. And if I, I don't use all mine, I can give some to somebody mm, else right. or somebody can give me theirs. But it, it, it's hard for us to do that. But it has to start with a, a self-examination, I, I think. I mean, mm-hmm. this is purely unscientific answer to your question, because but this is where I am right now. Mm-hmm. Um and, and I think we then have to sort of pass that along to our children that parents aren't perfect. We don't expect you to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And, and and as Caroline said earlier, we did not hide the fact that Thomas had mm-hmm. had gone off to, to rehab. We, we didn't publicize it, but we were honest with our friends. We were honest with our children. We were honest with his friends. They wanted to write him. They wanted to know where he was. And, and, and that was – we didn't want Thomas to think we were embarrassed. Um so, you know, and, and we've had it with our other children. They were certainly not perfect, despite Thomas's view of them as being perfect. They right. weren't. Right. As all of us, uh, you know, we've all made mistakes in our lives. But I think that that approach has to carry forward I- into our society. And, um, and and we talked about this a few minutes ago, that we so we have done such a poor job in our country around mental health. Um there, there's nothing wrong with admitting that you have anxieties. There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with admitting that you're going through depression. I, and I don't think any of us will go through our lives without some period of depression. It may be a mild depression. It, it may be a mild time of anxieties. It may not have to be medicated, but it certainly benefits from some kind of counseling. Um, Caroline and I have both been to and had some counseling since Thomas's death both professional and really more just, you know, just talking to friends and Mm -hmm. opening up with people that we trusted about things, talking to people who've been through the same thing that we've gone through, uh, support group type discussions. And so, you know, I I, I think that that the fear of the way others react to our problems is probably one of the biggest hindrances to addressing the mental health issues that we have because, People don't want to admit the problem, and they don't want people to perceive their children as having a problem. Yeah, I agree. I think um, as parents, you want your children to be perceived in the best light possible. Mm-hmm. So when something runs amok, it's it's hard as parents to to admit that and and be honest about it because you want people to think your children are good, and they are good. Mm-hmm. Everybody has stumbling blocks and anxieties. Yeah. So I think that's. That's the real thing about stigma is mm-hmm. just realizing your children aren't perfect and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you seen your family become closer because of this? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. No, no question. I, I feel like we were close before, um, but obviously a tragedy, mm-hmm. I guess it can either pull you apart or bring you closer. And fortunately, I feel like it's pulled Cal and I closer and, and us closer to our children and them to each other also. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine I can speak for myself on this of I'm in recovery and I'm sober and I know conversations in my house have changed when, since that. And I can only imagine what the conversations have been, how they've changed in your guys' house and obviously around in your communities. And it just takes one person, like you said, to speak up and have a question and it will impact your children, your grandkids will be impacted because of this and how powerful, like you're changing the next generation, you don't even know it. Right. I, you know, there, we can't go back and redo our children's childhood, yeah. but we can give our children's suggestions about yes. how they can right. things That's they can right. do better than we did when it comes to our grandchildren. So. Yeah, there was plenty of well, I'm not from Caroline's side, but from my side, plenty of parental malpractice <laughs> committed <laughs> in our household. But you know, the, anytime you see a family that looks like they've got everything going for, going for them and it's perfect, um, well, you know. Well, I think we're now old enough, wise enough, and we've been through enough, probably even before Thomas, but certainly after Thomas, that that's not true for any family. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've said this in front of groups. You know, every, every family has a little crazy in it, mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> and our family certainly does, and most families do. And I, I use crazy in kind of a broad sense to talk mm-hmm. about the issues that we all have to deal with. And the more I think we're open about that. The, the healthier we can become mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as a family, as a community, you know, as a country. Is there anything you guys would like to share that we haven't asked you that you would like to tell parents that you would anything? 
I, I think I'd really just like to say thank you to people. Um, the kindness that people have shown us, I mean, family, friends, strangers, has just been very humbling. I think it speaks well of Thomas, but I think it just speaks well of mankind. Um, and particular, particularly his friends. Mm -hmm. His young friends have been so intentional yeah. in their support and love and I have a, the privilege of knowing two of them at Gray and Avery, and they just, anytime I see them, how, how are things? Can I help? Right. What? How can I be involved? And I just, it makes me so happy. I feel like I know a piece of Thomas through y'all, but specifically through his friends, too. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could, if I could emotionally get through it, I could tell you several stories about Thomas and the people he touched, but. One thing that Caroline and I have just never ceased to surprise us is some random place in Oxford, somebody will walk up and say, oh, are you Thomas's mother? Are you Thomas's father? And it oftentimes is not somebody that fits the college student mold or appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's somebody from a completely different walk of life. And you know this, this has happened over and over again of people you're like, well, how in the world did you know Thomas? I went to school with him in high school and he was always so nice to me, you know, other people wouldn't speak to me and he always did. And I think that hearing those stories is a driving energy behind us wanting to spend time with the lab mm -hmm. because the lab is not designed for any particular type of person or you know, anybody from a certain walk of life. It's designed to hit, to provide information and offer hope for a person regardless of their background or their economic situation. And that's the beauty of the podcast mm -hmm. is that it gets it out there for anybody sure. who can access it and we can, all can access it. So thank you for helping us fulfill that dream in, in memory of Thomas because he was, you know, he didn't see color. He didn't see race. He didn't see economic status. Um, and it's important for us for this message to mimic his life and, mm -hmm. and his approach to people. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for raising such a great, sweet boy. <laughs> um, the goal of the Mail Lab podcast is to start a different conversation. I feel like we've given lots of different ways parents can, can do that in their families. But if y'all wouldn't mind leaving us with three specific takeaways for people of how they can have a different conversation with themselves this week how they can have a different conversation with their family, family units, and then how they can have a different conversation in their community. You go first? You go first. <laughs> uh, a different conversation with themselves. I, I think um, it, this week th I would ask a question, what's one thing I can, can change, however small, in what I'm doing that I know is um, maybe it's a bad habit or it's a, um, it's a, a way of thinking that I know is not healthy uh, or it's a relationship that I know means mending that's keeping me awake at night mm -hmm. or getting me out of bed early in the morning and address it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't don't wait. Address it now. Develop a plan of how you're going to go about addressing just that single one problem that's gnawing at you because it's those types of problems when they're all blended in together that keep us from the joy that we all want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I touched on this earlier, but as far as families, just to keep the conversation open and mm -hmm. as difficult as that can be for college kids, just just keep at it. Um, let them know that you're not going to judge. You're not going to you're not going to try and find the solution. You're you're there to listen and to support. That you know, we told Thomas often we're we're on Team Thomas. You know, we're, <laughs> we're on your team, and just to let your family members know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think from a community standpoint, I mean, we're in an election year in Mississippi, right? Mm -hmm. And what better time to be having conversations mm -hmm. about mental health with mm -hmm. our state leaders? And I under I don't I don't think there's any person running for public office that will tell you I don't want to do anything to help the mental health mm -hmm. problem. We all know the mental health problem mm -hmm. exists. It's expensive to fix. Um, but let's make sure the people we elect are committed to really addressing the mm -hmm. issue and putting whatever resources we can, mm -hmm. maybe just to hit one single mental health topic. Mm -hmm. But let's let's win on that one topic. One at a time, we, we can eventually get there. But this is a perfect time to have those mm -hmm. conversations um, mm -hmm. going into the fall before Absolutely. the elections in November. 
Yeah. I Wonderful. love that takeaway. That's awesome. We've had oh, such great nuggets of takeaways. I'm just so excited. Well, for listeners, um, any resource we talked about, the articles mm-hmm. Cal's written, it's wonderful. We've read it. We'll be in the links in the note, show notes, and it'll be available on our website, along with a host of other resources for families and individuals. So check those out. Um, and we will see you guys next week. And thank you, Cal and Caroline, again for joining. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Mayo Lab Podcast. The Mayo Lab Podcast is produced by Dr. Natasha Dieter, Dr. Megan Rosenthal, Alexis Lee, Slade Lewis, and Hannah Finch. This podcast was recorded at Broadcast Studio in Oxford, Mississippi. The show was mixed and mastered by Clay Jones, and our original music was composed by Slade Lewis. The Mayo Lab Podcast is brought to you by the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing. For more information on the Mayo Lab podcast, head over to themayolab.com and follow us on social media at The Mayo Lab. If you enjoyed listening to the Mayo Lab podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this podcast. This podcast represents the opinions of Dr. Megan Rosenthal, Alexis Lee, and their guests on the show. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for the medical advice of a licensed counselor or physician. The listener should consult with their mental health professional in any matters related to his or her health or the health of a child.